<clears throat> thanks everybody for being here. I appreciate it a lot. Um, I, just kind of to go back a little bit in, in history so you get an idea of uh, why I'm here, really. Uh, I'm, I'm here basically because uh, I've been working for 19 years to give music subtitles. So I was a manager, an agent, I was joking in the car on the way here, a recovering manager, a recovering agent. <laughs> um, but for me, I, you know, I was given the job to run the European Music Office in the U.S. and the French Music Export Office in the U.S. Uh, and when I took those jobs back in 2004, I told the people who hired me, if you really want to do this right, uh, we need to give music subtitles. And they kind of looked at me like I had two heads, you know, I was like, what do you mean? Uh, the uh, French um, said, uh, c'est trop compliqué, c'est trop difficile, c'est uh, prendre ton, le temps, it takes too long. I was like, okay, well, if, um, sorry for my bad French. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, if, um, you know, for me, uh, growing up, I was very lucky. My parents had uh, music from uh, albums from all over the world, and I was telling my friends from Hungary over here that I just met that I, I learned to read by you know reading the back of album covers and all that. Um, so for me, I learned about the world really through music and through the context of music. And uh, some people are more lyric people, some people are more music people, but you know for me, I, I, you know the the, the meaning of songs is really important. So back in 2004, I kind of just took on this mission to give music subtitles, and really that's what the Bell M project is about. It's about lyric monetization, but it's also about what would Europe be like if everybody could understand everybody's songs without singing in English, uh, you know, the de facto export music language English, right? Um, you know, if you guys couldn't understand English and there wasn't a simultaneous translator here, you know, you wouldn't be here, right? But for me, if, if there's an artist on stage with something really important to say, I want to understand what they're actually saying. So, like I said, I've been working on this for 19 years, since 2004. Uh, YouTube uh, did closed captioning because of my work, and they told me that, which was nice. Uh, I was lobbying for a while before they did that. And they've made literally many billions, billions of dollars on the closed captioning through advertising and keeping people online. Um, and of course, Spanish song music has done the best because of the closed captioning. Uh, Despacito launched on YouTube, not on Spotify. Uh, the closed captioning came in just before Despacito. And in America now, Spanish song music is a billion dollar business. When YouTube started closed captioning, it was about 200 million. So it's up 500% uh, in the time uh, since then. Of course, labels spent more money, publishers spent more money. If gringos like me who don't speak Spanish could understand Spanish song music, uh, of course, there's a lot of Spanish speaking people in the States as well. And the States are roughly 30, 40, 50% of the world's music um, business. So, you know, it was important. So it demonstrated it. but. What we do that's different is human translations. Uh, Google's YouTube, uh, you know, Google Translate AI doesn't really get Macedonian to English well enough, or sorry, whatever language you speak here, I'm sorry. Uh, I guess it's Macedonian, is that what it's called? Yeah, okay, thanks guys. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's much worse than Spanish English, and the reason is because Spanish is spoken by half a billion people, English is spoken by half a billion people, native English, you know, it's really spoken by about three billion, but now there's eight billion people in the world. So, um, if we want music to actually uh, go beyond our own diaspora of language, and for me, international music <coughs> has phenomenal writers from all over the world, even in languages that are disappearing, you know, even very small languages, indigenous languages, Right now, we live in a you know huge crisis in the world after the pandemic, the war, the refugees, uh, immigrants everywhere around the world, and we want to be able to understand each other through songs, right? I mean, not propaganda songs, but uh, songs that actually mean something. So anyway, so the Bell M project was that, and and the EU uh, gave us a very very high evaluation. Uh, and now we have four years to give music subtitles and to monetize lyrics. 
and also to overcome some of the copyright infringement that's happening in lyric exhibition. I'm not sure how much all of you know about publishing, but in publishing there's mechanical rights, there's uh, performance rights, and there's also reproduction rights. So lyric falls under reproduction rights. And in America, you might have heard, there's a thing called the Music Modernization Act and the Mechanical Licensing Collective, MMA, MLC. And what they've done is the DSPs, uh, Spotify, Google, etc., paid uh, to actually create a database of correct metadata so that, so that uh, really they did that and they paid millions of dollars to do that. And they also, once they did that, they also then put, I think, $400 million back into the music system that they were holding uh, because they couldn't figure out who to pay it to. It's really what they said. Um, you know, there was a lawsuit um, by David Lowry, who I used to represent when he was a musician uh, before Spotify did their IPO, and it was $68 million uh, from Spotify back to the class action lawsuit. So I talk about infringement because actually right now, um, I don't know if there's anybody here from Spotify in the audience, but uh, Spotify is using our competitor. There's only one competitor to Lyric Find called Music Smash. And if your lyrics are on Spotify here in Macedonia, and that means they're probably on Spotify in America. And the copyright infringement penalty for one exhibition, one exhibition, one click, is $150,000 maximum. You won't get $150,000, but uh, if your lyrics are not licensed right now to Music Smash, if your publisher has not licensed your lyrics to Music Smash and they're on Spotify, you have a very significant opportunity to generate income through a lawsuit, uh, and which is pretty easy in America, and people would take it on spec. So you can talk to me about that afterwards. I don't want that to be a big part of this, but, but Copyright infringement and shutting down copyright infringement is part of our EU grant as well. And in four years, I want to make sure that you know the lyric licensing is legal. The when they paid for the MMA and the MLC, that protects them against mechanicals and performances, but not against reproduction rights, not against lyric exhibition rights. So remember that that could be the biggest tip you know of, of this conference for you. I mean, it could change things dramatically if you're getting infringed a lot, uh, so, and you probably are. So, um, the Bell M Project is, Lyric Find is a partner, so there's actually 14 EU partners, uh, as uh, Dario mentioned, Deezer, uh, two WIN network members, Runda, which is five countries or seven countries now? Seven countries now, um, and Portugal is a May, um, publishers, it's for capacity building for publishers to also understand about this. And when I say publishers, remember lyric exhibition rights are a publishing right, so the songwriters and publishers get paid. I'll go through my uh, deck pretty soon. But the artists are also generating money and the labels are also generating money. Why and how? Because when lyrics are exhibited online, people listen more times and longer over the 30 second get paid, don't get paid you know, uh, duration. So your master income goes up, you know, the, the label income goes up, and the artists get paid as well through that. Um, so uh, I'll go through the deck, but I really do want you guys to ask questions afterwards or, or meet me later and ask questions about some of this stuff. So think about some questions, and I'll just go through the, the Lyric Find deck and uh, kind of explain how Lyric Find licenses lyrics from the music publishers to the platforms. And we also have something that's really, uh, I think, great for labels as well, uh, which is uh, we make lyric videos uh, and also lyric translation videos, which is something I was envisioning you know, 19 years ago, because obviously when you have an image along with the music, along with the words in your language, you know, there's a whole other element of, uh, of impact. Uh, it's hitting your brain in different places. And of course, lyrics hit your brain in different places than music does, right? It's the left-right hemisphere. So, uh, under, you know, the, the, you know um, a new friend from Hung Hungary said that she doesn't, wasn't really sure that she wants to know the lyrics, she'd rather make them up herself. So, 
my line about that is, well, you know, you can choose uh, ignorance is bliss or knowledge is power, no problem. You know, and if you don't want to know the lyrics, you don't have to know the lyrics. You know, you press the button to see the lyrics or the lyric translations. Um, uh, so, anyway, sorry about that, but, you know, um, it, it, it's, um, it, you know, for me, I, I would love to be able to see the lyrics of, see the lyrics, and read the lyrics, in translation of every band that I hear for the next few nights, you know, even if it's in English, oftentimes we can't understand. Um, the first time I saw Eight Mile, the Eminem movie, I was like, "Wow, this guy can write!" You know, I could never really understand. My son could understand. You know, he grew up in hip hop, but I couldn't really understand the words, even though they were in English, because they're fast and you know, it's just a different pace, um, or maybe I've just never paid enough attention to it, but when you read it, you can understand it, and you can appreciate great writers, like I said, from around the world. So I'm going to just uh, run through the deck a little bit now. <coughs> Oops. Sorry. My computer is having a little difficulties here. Okay. Lyric find. So, I mean, you can all read this stuff. 18 years. Yeah, I, I'm, I live in New York. There's one other. Um, uh, what's this? There's one other uh, publishing. My publishing teams in New York, but there's about 70 people in Toronto, and we have teams around the world. Um, so that's what we do. So, publishers and songwriters, uh, we get the rights, license from publishers and songwriters, we have all the major publishers, but my job is to get the rights from you guys, to do deals with all the publishers here, and, and also explain what this is, uh, and how, how, how it works. So we, we get the song data, which is basically metadata from the publishers, um, or sometimes we have direct deals with the songwriters. Um, in, in Portugal, we have a deal with the most famous, iconic songwriter who's passed away, who helped create the revolution, uh, the Carnation Revolution in Portugal, Jose Afonso, for example, his estate. So the, the song data comes to us. We either create the lyrics, which means we transcribe the lyrics, or sometimes we get them from digital distributors. We have agreements with The Orchard, with Believe, with Fuga, 1RPM, DistroKid. If you send the lyrics to them, then we probably have your lyrics, but unless we have the rights to show your lyrics, we're not gonna show them. So the rights are important as well. So these are some of our bigger clients, Google, YouTube Music, Amazon. Mercedes-Benz is a client now, so everything, the music in Mercedes-Benz, you can see the lyrics from it, from us. We get money per car, and then we count the clicks, and we pay the people. So the lyrics requests and lyric usages of course, the fans have the benefit of that. Then, uh, so we make deals with all our different clients. We have about 125 different clients. The, a new one that I really like is hospitals, hospitals and senior living centers. They pipe in music to about 6,000 hospitals in America and senior living centers, and uh, the lyrics can be shown too, so for healing purposes, obviously people can sing along and, and all that. And then, uh, we um, pay royalties to the publishers and songwriters, and I'll show you how that works too. Oh, God. I don't know why this one isn't working. Um, yes, yeah, so <laughs> sorry about this. I don't know what's going on. My computer is uh, jet lagged. <laughs> um, Yeah, that's our mission, empower and innovate through lyrics and lyric translations. God. Well, 
lyric videos are what I told you. So we can make anywhere from one lyric video at a time up to 10,000 lyric videos at a time. So if you have a label with a big catalog, we can basically, uh, it's a DDEX file that we get from your distributors or from you directly with images and the rest. Uh, if the lyrics in our, are in our database timestamped already, the first lyric video, you tell us, you know, tell the machine really how you want the font to look, how big you want it, what color, you know, what size, what type of font, that kind of thing. And we make videos from your DDEX files. So it can be 41 seconds on the first one, and if you have a big catalog and you just replace album cover artwork or band photos or whatever, we can use videos, we can use um, still images or animation for that. So that's a really good thing for labels because you can make a ton of lyric videos that you've never made before very inexpensively. Uh, we call it free to create. We do take some kind of a back-end percentage, and this is going to be self-serve on some of the distributors' platforms pretty soon. So lyric videos or lyric translation videos as well. And a lyric translation video, um, one example that I was involved with, I represented the music of Brazil for North America, and a very famous, uh, iconic Brazilian artist known as the best hip-hop writer in Brazil, uh, Emicida, uh, household name in Brazil, but not known anywhere else around the world until he did lyric translations and then he became, you know, very successful in other countries because people can understand the Portuguese hip hop and he's, he's an amazing writer. Um, it totally changed his career and he, he did it with every song. Um, so Lyric IQ is something that's more of a technology. Um, what we do is we analyze lyrics at scale for syncs or for playlisting. So we could figure out which songs are written about hunger or, uh, or you know, breakup songs or, you know, all kinds of different themes and as well the different emotions that are in the songs through the lyrics. Generally speaking, the, um, the companies that focus on uh, synchronization focus more on the melodies and all that. But uh, the melodies could be a very upbeat, happy song and the... Uh, the words could be about school shootings or something like pumped up kicks, for example. Um, so, you know, you need to actually understand what the lyrics are talking about as well, the theme of it. Oh, um, oh, here it's working now. All right. Uh, this is really important. So, revenue. Um, it's, I mentioned it a little bit before. But the per stream royalty rate, how much money you make per stream as a publisher, doubles on average when the lyrics are exhibited, times two, on a paid subscription service. Per stream money, I know it's micro pennies, but it's double the micro pennies uh, for the publishers when the lyrics are exhibited. On an ad supported service, a free service, uh, it's times four. So the, the rate goes up times four when the lyrics are exhibited. And that's just the money for the lyric exhibition. The mechanicals increase, the performance royalties increase, and of course the mastering income increases as well. We've done studies, it's at least 10% increase on master income, you know, for the artists and the labels and the distributors uh, as well. The 10% works for the mechanicals and the performances and all interactive neighboring rights, all the rest of it as well. Because people listen longer and more times when the lyrics are exhibited. We have 200 countries, we give you detailed royalty reports, credits, publisher and writer attribution, credits is super important. Uh, we do high quality lyrics, so we're not user generated, which is what our competitor is, they do user generated. We transcribe, we pay people to transcribe every song, or we get it from the distributors who get it from the labels. So these are high quality lyrics. Um, and their license lyrics. Uh, and then of course you have full control as well. Um, yeah, the translations and lyric merch is something that we do as well. So uh, businesses can license your lyrics for different products as well through, I mean, uh, we have a whole deal with uh, posters, uh, like Beatles lyrics and Stones lyrics and stuff, and it's all approved by the publishers and the, and the publishers generate income on that. Um, so yes, these are some of our partners. Xperia is the OEM that uh, services Mercedes-Benz um, and many other cars. I think uh, another car company is coming out really soon. 
those are some of our um, our plat platforms, but it's over 120 platforms. We have deals with all the big publishers and many CMOs, um, uh, collective management organizations. I was lucky enough through Dario to meet in Croatia with the Croatian Society. I'm hoping to meet with somebody here from uh, the Macedonian Society, if that's uh, possible. Um, and you know, we have deals with about 15,000 publishers representing about 70,000 publishing catalogs now. Um, <laughs> th these three majors are also our clients, so we actually service them with their lyrics, which is kind of odd, but they pay us to, to uh, actually uh, make sure their lyrics are back to them so they could use them for whatever purposes they need them for, synchronization, placement, whatever. Um, so yeah, we have many languages that we work with. Uh, we do have somebody in uh, Eastern Europe, in Ukraine right now. We had a team in Russia uh, as well. So we work with many different languages, but part of my role here, and if there's any um, kind of archive of Macedonian lyrics, uh, talk to me about that, because we can also license directly. I was talking to our Hungarian friends about a company in Hungary that we're presumably going to be working with to get all of the Hungarian lyrics that are also um, cleared through the publishing organization, the CMO in Hungary, and the Publishers Association as well. We also work with Publishers Associations. Um, and we, ha you know, so we have teams around the world as well if, if we don't have somebody in Canada doing it. <sighs> These are some of the uh, different com countries that we have reps around the world. Uh, uh, and this doesn't have the Bell M partners on here, but there's 14 Bell M partners as well. Uh, so I talked about this before, ancillary income, uh, but this is super important because besides the lyric exhibition income you make directly from us per click, you also are generating master track income. Like I said, the labels are making more money, the distributors are making more money, the artists are making more money. Sinks go up, and why do sinks go up? Because if a director or a music supervisor, an editor can't find your lyrics, you know, or is looking for something also maybe in Macedonian language, but doesn't speak Macedonian, that's where a lyric translation helps. But um, if your lyrics are not on Google search, then chances are, and they're only on Google search, we were the only vendor for Google search, but because of Article 17, they had to add our competitor. So now us and our competitor service Google search. But it's really important for your lyrics to be out there so that sync super music supervisors can find them for the film, television, and advertising. I've supervised a few movies as well and done some advertising and television. And the lyrics always have to make sense for the person to actually put them in the film. They have to have something to do with the action or make a joke or something. Uh, so, so you have to know the lyrics before you sync something. Even if you're only using the instrumental track, you still need to know the lyrics. Um, sponsorships, there's a lot of uh, different companies that use lyrics. Uh, um, karaoke obviously goes up. Basically every single new music technology since lyrics are 50% of the value of a song, any new music technology could be um, improved by having lyrics uh, exhibited. So really every new music technology that comes into existence obviously counts on the lyrics to be a driver of, of their technology, of their audience, right? Uh, you know, from TikTok to anything else. So we do have a deal with Rezo as well, which is eventually going to be TikTok music, like Google Play was uh, before YouTube music. So um, we have a deal with Rezo, we're the only vendor for Rezo, um, which is the TikTok uh, subscription service. And of course, the, the more people know the lyrics to your songs, the more fans you have. You have a new customer, you have a new consumer. Your song has done what a song is supposed to do, which is cross the, uh, the line and get into the people's heads and hearts and you know, butts and feet for dancing or whatever. You know, the lyrics are actually uh, what people remember of the songs. They might remember seeing the band, oh, it's a great band, it was very cool, but they don't remember the songs unless they know the lyrics, you know. So the songs themselves, uh, the monomic device of songs are generally lyrics, you know. If you're a bass player, you might remember every bass line, but, but people in general 
are moved by the lyrics. So, so really, uh, what Lyric Exhibition does, we live in the digital global world, what Lyric Exhibition does is it just creates more fans for you. It's the, it's the most important fan discovery model there is, and if your lyrics are not exhibited on all the platforms, you're really missing the boat. And if you're a publisher, you're really not doing what you're supposed to be doing, which is exploiting the song, exploiting in a positive sense. Generating income for the songwriters, same thing with labels. So it's really important to actually make sure the lyrics are licensed to us and to Music Smash so they get on Spotify legally and uh, their other services as well. So yeah, Lyric Videos just allows labels to create Lyric Videos at scale. Uh, to do all the tracks rather than just one or two tracks um, uh, and much much cheaper and lots of uh, creative control as well so you can make it really interesting as well um, and as well as the translations too um, and not just have it be AI Google Translate we do human translations so Deezer has launched human translations of the top through us of the top 10,000 Anglophone songs in four different languages. Uh, it's probably not available here, but if you're in France, you could read all the top 10,000 songs in French, the, the translations, human translations in French. If you're in Germany, you could read it in German. And that's what the Bell M Project is also meant to do, so that by the end of the Bell M Project, all the DSPs on give music subtitles. We were all sitting home for a couple of years, mostly watching Netflix and seeing subtitles on all the movies. Imagine if, if music had subtitles. Last night in Toronto, um, at a place called Lula Lounge, it's about a 300 capacity club, there was a band who sings in five different languages. Um, Farsi is one of them. So we translated all of their songs in different languages and we showed them live. And that's what I'm trying to get Login to do with his uh, great artists who are still singing in Macedonian as well to have when they're performing in different countries that have different language base It's pretty simple to translate it and to show it. I mean, there's mostly most clubs have well, big clubs and venues have video screens It's it's really simple to do that So we do live lyric translations as well and that's part of the Bell M grant as well So we could even help pay for some of that stuff if if the if the situation is right um, so yeah, Lyric IQ does emotion and sentiment analysis, content filters, and the subject matter analysis at scale. So we have about six million lyrics in our database, but remember there's about a hundred million songs on Spotify. And I could, I could probably check how many songs we have in the Macedonian language. It's probably not very many, but uh, you know, we do have some because we have them from the distributors. Uh, and I'm sure there's artists here who go through DistroKid or uh, uh, Orchard or 1RPM. <clears throat> so, yeah, this is the whole translation thing. We've done, <clears throat> have been successful with grants in Canada too. Canada is obviously a bilingual country, English and French, but they have lots of uh, indigenous languages as well. And I don't know, <clears throat> you probably saw the Pope went there recently to uh, apologize to the indigenous people for the residential schools and for the way the Catholic Church basically helped create genocide in Canada. So indigenous languages are very important in Canada as well at this point and around the world, the U.S. too. I mean, genocide is the U.S. as well. Uh, so we have grants with indigenous um, companies who are the key partners, labels, management companies as well, to revitalize and reclaim indigenous languages uh, through lyrics and translations. Songs were illegal. Songs were illegal for over 120 years. Their language was illegal, uh, completely illegal. And people had to like <clears throat> pretty much memorize these songs. And I had the amazing honor of being invited on a grant, small grant to meet some elders out in Western Canada and Alberta and go to the land and uh, kind of learn from the land. And, and I used to say uh, that there's songs of indigenous songs that are 40,000 years old, 40,000 years old songs in the north of Australia. These people know what the ocean floor looks like 200 miles out into the ocean. It's pretty amazing because of oral tradition, not even written tradition, because it didn't used to be ocean back then, it was land. Anyway, <clears throat> the elder corrected me and said, no, no, you don't understand. These are not 40,000 years old. These are 40 millennia old because nobody wrote these songs. These are songs we heard from the sky and from the land and 
These are songs we heard and we uh, transferred to our children to learn about the, the world, uh, the, the natural world, and the cos cosmos as well. So anyway, um, <clears throat> the Bell M project also has uh, indigenous component and uh, immigrant component. It's the double and quadruple, like I said, streaming services. Um, so it's, it's, it's really a big bump, and it's even more than that again, because Mechanical's performance as Master Income goes up. These are some integrations of, of lyrics. Um, of course, uh, when you speak to a speaker and you tell them to play the song that has these lyrics in it, that comes from us as well, the search function to Google Home and Alexa and all that. Um, so it's important. Now little kids think that that's how music goes when you speak to a speaker and the speaker starts playing the music. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's important to have your lyrics in the lyric databases so that when the speaker when the kid says in Macedonian, you know, play me the song that has these lyrics in it, you know, M Alexa can find it uh, on the streaming services. So basically you can license uh, worldwide or territory by territory, catalog wide or song by song. We pay the same to Universal Music Group, to a small publisher, it's 50% of the revenue. We basically take all the costs, so it's all net. All the publishers have to do is get us their song data so we know how to pay them and how much to pay them and which songs they represent. So it's you know potentially significant income. Um, and you know even little income, micro pennies add up. I mean, publishing is a micro penny business. And, it's really important uh, for artists who are making little money to make more money so that they can eventually quit their day job and become full-time musicians. <clears throat> yeah, we track, report, and pay directly. It's not that much song data that we need, really. Any distributor has it. It's the title, the song ID, the writer's song ID that has to stay the same so we know which song it is, the writer information, first and last name, the administration shares and uh, the territories that are administered. It's pretty simple. We can do CSV, which is Excel files. We can take uh, JSON files, which most IT people know how to do, or common works registrations called CWR, which publishers, big publishers, have everything in CWR. That's how they get it to their um, <coughs> CMOs um, generally. We can even take DDEX files, so that's, we can take the XML from the DDEX files, so if your distributor has lyrics, we can get them from the distributor. Um, that's it, pretty much on the deck. Um, let me just uh, open it to questions, please. Uh, and, you know, um, uh, I don't know if, uh, if, you know, kind of you all got the importance of this, but these are your songs, you know, uh, the songs that as a label, as a publisher, as a manager, as an artist, that you're trying to uh, get across to all of your potential fans in the world. Um, so, you know, please ask me questions if you have any. Great, thanks. Yeah. Um. I don't know how it is in the rest of the world, but I know in Belgium, um, for a song, half of the, the author rights or copyrights go to the, for the, uh, are for the music. The other half is for the for the, the those, Great question. Who, those who write the, the song lyrics. Um, what sometimes happens is that somebody makes a translation of, say, a Macedonian song in Flemish. I don't know if that has happened, but okay. I hope so. In, in that case, 50% of the lyrics would go to the, the one who makes the translation? No, no. Okay, no. so basically, this is a really good point. You really asked about two questions. We pay the lyricist and, of course, the composer who does the music as well, because it's the song as a whole. It doesn't exist separately. So the first question that you didn't really ask, but I want to make sure everybody understands, is that the composer is also making money on all the lyric exhibitions. It's the song as a whole. So when I ask about writer splits, it's also the composer. Even if you don't write the lyrics, the composer makes money. Second part of your question, which is also a really great question, and thanks for asking it, is we don't take any rights on this. So this is rights free. So what that means is that the original publisher in Macedonia doesn't have to pay somebody to write it in Flemish and then or that Flemish 
translator says, I want 50% of your song because, or whatever, 25% or 10% or whatever the number is. And that's why music doesn't have subtitles. Because in the past, you had to negotiate song by song by song. We have rights from all the major publishers now to do it, but we're actually creating the human lyric translation and giving it to the original publisher and the original songwriter. So the original publisher and the original songwriter now is making money in four languages on Deezer. They make money for the original lyric click and then they make money for the French click or the German click or whatever. So they're also, besides the increase here, they're also increasing as, as well because it's two different sources of income. And, Google, and YouTube doesn't pay that with Google Translate with closed captioning. When we have lyrics, human lyric translations, Google will pay it. So each time you hit the closed captioning, the publisher will get paid. Uh, and similarly with lyric videos, there's a big problem right now that we're trying to help the label solve is that, remember what I said about the $150,000 in the beginning of this, copyright infringement, it's the same with lyric videos. When a lyric video is shown, it's the label that gives YouTube the lyric video. Not the publisher. That's wrong. You know, the publisher should make reproduction rights from Google on the on the on the YouTube lyric video on every single lyric video. That means it's one hundred fifty thousand dollars per exhibition. Again, per exhibition per click, with YouTube as well. So the labels know that, and now I'm talking about the major labels know that. So what they want to do is they want to take a piece of what they get and pay the publishers, and that's what we're trying to do as well. Because that's what it's supposed to be. You know, the publisher should get money as well, besides mechanicals and performances, which they do get on lyric videos. They don't get reproduction rights. So, uh, did that answer your question? Yes, definitely. But I was also interested in um, to know because a lot of things you're saying are quite technical, and I'm, I know some about it, but okay. uh, not not that much. But I was also wondering, translation is an artistic process, I think, and how do you deal with that? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, we pay people who are vetted uh, translators, who are native speakers of the language that it's translated into, very important, to, to do the translations rights-free, okay? Uh, ultimately, like in a way, what I used to say was this is where copyright meets copyleft, okay? On the translator side, they're not doing it to get paid. I mean, they get paid for, per translation, or they're doing it because they want this Macedonian song to be understood in Flemish, right? So they're doing it out of respect for the original song. It's a really important song for them. They want their people to be able to understand it. So what we're doing is, on the translator side, we're not, we're not finding the best, it's not like translating a Rilke uh, book, right? We're not finding the best translator in the world and paying them for it. What we're trying to do is what uh, YouTube does with closed captioning, which still raised Spanish song music times five, right? But we're doing it better because these are human translations. These are not AI translations. So the, the level of translation for Macedonian into Flemish would be terrible with Google Translate, right? It would be ridiculous. But with a human translator who speaks those two languages, it could be really good. But they're not getting any of the rights. They're just doing it because they want to contribute to the original songwriter and the original publisher. So in Europe, that means that all the small languages as well, once this happens, all the small languages can have the benefit of the number of people in Germany or the number of people in France or the number of people who speak Spanish or English around the world, probably three billion people, right? So your Flemish songs uh, in Belgium translated into English alone makes it from a language that I can't remember how many people speak, not that many, into a language that three billion people speak. So, so the translation is the copyleft part of it. There's no rights on the translations. We're giving this to the original songwriter and the original publisher, which is a huge gift, because if you have to pay for translations in all these languages, it, it gets expensive. You know, we paid for 40,000 translations. <laughs> you know, I know how expensive that is. Uh, so, th does that answer your question? Yeah. But really great questions, thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Hi. Uh, so my, my question is uh, really specific towards hip-hop music. 
uh, you yourself said regarding Eminem. So that's a pretty good example because Eminem is one of the artists that has really complex lyrics. So th they are complex in meaning and slang, also. slang, yeah. uh, complex in technicalities between like using homonyms, right. double, triple entendres. Right. So how does that translate to uh, to artists and translating uh, into a different language? Because yeah, it's difficult. Do, do they lose meaning? Like uh, what is of the artistry behind the translation? Because sometimes you cannot translate it the way you want it to, and that loses it, loses the but meaning. There, there's two points here. One is we're translating for meaning, not for rhyme, not for singing, right? If it's not an adaptation, so we're not. At, it's it, it's very different from an adaptation. Okay, I remember I used to work with a French band. They were pretty famous in French, a French rock band called Les Rita Mitsuko. And I remember we talked about translations years before, I, you know, this was like I don't know, a long time ago, before I started thinking about this. But he said, well, how do you translate um, see you later, alligator? And I said, well, maybe a plus tard le czar. You know, I mean, I was just trying, right? It's like, kind of, it means kind of the same thing. See you later, lizard, instead of alligator. But it rhymes also. So. It's a good question, and remember, AI, Google Translate, has raised five times reggaeton and Spanish song music in America. Bad lyric translations. It's not going to be perfect, but what it does is it makes people think, and then people actually try to make it better and better and better, like Wikipedia. So it gets people thinking, and 80% of a meaning of a song, if I could understand 80% of the meaning of all the Macedonian songs, I, or Serbian, or the different bands I see here singing in different languages here, I would be a richer person for it. I don't mean money, I mean, you know. Uh, you know so when Emicida did it in English, he worked with people who he trusted on the translation, and they gave really good translations. And some of the context, like the first time I got the whole album, is called O Glorioso. Check it out, it's a beautiful album. The first time I saw it on Vimeo, he, you know, he sent it to me. He did every, every song, right? Some of it was making of, some of it was videos, whatever. I couldn't leave until I read the whole thing. And some of it I didn't get because they were talking about Brazilian politicians, specific guys' names and stuff, and I didn't really understand the context. But at least it gave me a window into, some of it I understood a lot, you know, there's a song called uh, dream Millionaire, you know, it's a beautiful song, great lyrics. So, you know, you're, you're ne it's never going to be perfect, uh, you know, even if with Rilke or, you know, or the greatest Macedonian writers, it's probably not perfect translations, but it gets better and better and better, and it makes people think about what the song really means. So hip-hop, you know, rock and roll, uh, just joking on the way here, even Schlager music in Germany, if that was translated, it would be much bigger around the world, you know. Songs have meaning, so it, 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 but human translations do a lot better than machine translations, so that's what we use. But it's, it's, it's also a good question, and you know, it just, the thing is that even movies, sometimes subtitles aren't great, right? You know, the subtitles aren't perfect, but at least you understand what they're saying and you know, you get the meaning of it. So we, we translate for the meaning, not for the meter, not for the rhyme. Uh, but people can then, it also creates more cover tunes. You know, if there's a great Macedonian song translated into Flemish and some, you know, Belgian guy says, hey man, I want to cut this song, I want to actually do it, this is a great song, you know, in, in, in your language, and maybe they do an adaptation or whatever. But it, it basically it's just uh, exchanging the culture and the meaning and what the songwriter intended when he sat down and wrote the song. Yeah, uh, I understand, but... Uh, my question was more towards uh, like being lost in translation. The way that, uh, let's say, some of the some of the rappers personally that I listen to uh, do songs so they can showcase their lyrical skill. The way they they write their lyrics. So basically, the way the, the lyrics are structured, the way the the rhyme well, headers you know, there's are always, planned, there's always that's the focus. There's always the two sides, right? There's lost in translation and found in translation. So do you want to? Um, get 80% of, of the meaning of what they're saying or not. You know, if, if, if they don't want it to be translated, it doesn't have to be translated. If they want you to learn Macedonian to, to understand the song, then that's their choice. But if they want the meaning of their song to be understood by an extra three billion people, even if it's not perfect, you know, then 
a friend of mine who used to run Womex, uh, Gerald Seligman, uh, said, I learned Portuguese because I loved Fado music. And I was scared because I thought, if oh, I spent all this time learning Portuguese, and maybe I'm not going to like it so much in Portuguese. And he said it was the opposite. So, you know, the, the, you know, just just one band in Germany, Tokyo Hotel, increased German uh, language education in France times seven. That's what the Beatles did when I was a kid. You know, the Beatles and the Stones and everything. People spoke English because. You know, or learned English because they wanted to know what rock and roll was, you know, or what movies were. So if there's a great Macedonian or whatever, you know, hip hop artist, and you get 80% of it, when I, you know, Emicida, like I said, I didn't understand the context. I didn't get 100% of it. You know, some of the slang might have been off, but still, I got this guy's a freaking great writer. You know, I mean, you can understand what a great writer he is. So, so for the hip hop bands, especially since it's all, you know, it's, a lot of it's about their words and. You know, there's mumble rap too, you know, what does that mean, right? I mean, but, you know, and some, some uh, artists sing in no language, like Sigaross, right? Or, you know, there's some French bands too, where they make up their own language, but that's their prerogative. But if, if you know, if, uh, if the hip-hop artists are understood by many, many more people around the world, they're going to be listened to by many, many more people around the world. They're going to be able to do collaborations too. Reggaeton, I mean, Bieber would have never worked on Despacito unless he understood the words. Same thing with Beyonce and all the rest of them. You have to actually, artistic collaborations too. There's so many multilingual songs that are blowing up in Africa right now, uh, in, um, you know, even J-pop and K-pop. They, they always understood the value of language. Why? Because they didn't want everybody to start speaking English. Japan vinyl always had lyric translations. And translations of the liner notes. You have to understand the context where things are coming from to really understand the music, you know. So, so the translation lyrics are one part of it, but also, you know, what else this artist is actually, you know, where their worldview is, you know, where they're coming from. But it's not, it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing, you know, for me anyway. Go ahead. Uh, Hi. Uh, so I actually was inter interested in the part where you categorize the content as violent as sexist nudity. This kind of reminded me of a very old Frank Zappa trial in the 80s he had with the court. And he was actually asking the court based on which criteria you categorize it and based on which law. Of course, in the US, you're based on the law in the US that says that this is, this is bad. But for example, if you well, have we never said opinion, it's bad. No, it's bad. It's, it's good. You, you categorize it in a way based on a law in a country. But yeah. if it's, for example, an Albanian song, since I'm from Albania. Right. And when it's in Albanian, it has a slang meaning which is not violent. In in English, it might sound violent, but it's not. Based on which criteria is that categorized as violent or non-proper? It's a good question. And so far, we only have lyric IQ for English. Uh, what, what we would need to do if we were going to do Albanian is basically have Albanian people or people who speak Albanian fluently. Um, because it, what lyric I, the way lyric IQ started, it's human. First, identifying many, many different words and then analyzing how often the words are in what context in the song. It's pretty complicated, but it's human first, and then it's AI, and then it's machine learning, so it kind of gets better and better. But right now, it only works for English. Um, and, you know, you're right, you know, it's not about good, bad, it's about if Disney doesn't want fuck you on their Disney channel, you know, uh, or whatever, um, you know, so, so the, the important thing is, um, the important thing is that we can do that based on what the client wants. If the client is a sync company, if the client is a kid's, uh, you know, uh, whatever, um, parental guidance, whatever, we, we can do that, you know, so, um, it's a good, you know, it, it's a fair question. Because basically, if you take most of the folk songs, for example, from my country, and translate them in English, okay, you might have an understanding of the thing, but the entire slang will sound probably even violent or sexual in some languages. So basically, I get if it's categorized based on the language you translate it, but I don't believe like there's just one kind of decision over it, because in Albanian it sounds different, sometimes different. You know? no, I totally it's understand. Kind of and, you know, right? and that's the whole point of what we're doing, really, right? Because I didn't know that until you just said that, right? So that is exactly the point of what we're trying to do here, of why I've been working for 19 years to give music subtitles, so that we understand the different cultures, right? So that exactly we understand, you know, 
uh, that kind of information, right? And that kind of information maybe comes through subtitles and films, maybe a little bit, you know, but that's what, you know, I want the world to understand, you know, really. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's uh, important that people understand the cultural dif di differences and the language differences and where things come from and what folk music is about and, and all of that, you know. So and the only way to do that is for translations, there's no... There's no globalization without localization. You know, it's a cliche, but you you need to know the culture. You, you need to have the language skills. I couldn't be here if I didn't. You know, if you guys didn't speak English, right? We, you know, globalization is based on localization. So if Logan's band is playing in uh, South America and he has Spanish translations on there, people are going to go crazy, right? You know, uh, because. You're speaking, okay, Avril Lavigne, one chorus of one song, her song Girlfriend, in Mandarin. One chorus of one song sung in Mandarin. It's a little different, we're not talking about subtitles. She sang it in Mandarin. Became a Chinese superstar overnight. Overnight, 19 magazine covers, a friend of mine was there when it happened. She became a Chinese superstar overnight. One chorus of one song in Mandarin. When Mount Mandela, when you speak to someone in their language, you're speaking to their heart. You speak to them in your language, you're speaking to their head. You know, it's, it's a big difference. So language is super important, obviously. And uh, all I'm trying to do, or all we're trying to do with the EU, um, you know, four years, two million euros, partners like Deezer, is actually allowing people to understand the great Albanian writers or the great Hungarian writers uh, and artists. Uh, and Basically, all of them will benefit from it. And why do all of them benefit from it? Because the fans benefit from it. You know, we, we do all of the stuff that we do for the fans that we're never going to meet, right? I mean, that's the music business. So, um, and the music community, it's, it's, it's uh, <clears throat> you know, and it, and it, and it, it uh, one of my favorite expressions is stasis is a motherfucker, right? It's hard to change things, but, you know, all of you here are changing things in what you're doing every day, right? So, so thank goodness the EU also said, hey, you know, go for it, yeah. If music has subtitles, there's gonna be cross-border uh, uh, benefits for, for human beings, you know, for cultures, uh, as well as for the artists, and the music community, and publishers and labels and all that, managers. Any other questions here? Yeah. Hi, so I'm an artist, a part of a band where we sing in six or seven uh, different languages from the different areas from the bulk. And uh, what we are doing at the moment, we are using poems from authors that had passed away a long time ago. And usually the, this type of language is a rural language. So how would this work with translating it, with finding the right person to translate a language that maybe nobody speaks or understands anymore because it's it's not just Macedonian but it's like old Macedonian or old Albanian or old Turkish so I'm curious how how it would work because people love the music but they cannot understand the language so it would be really nice to be able to translate it but how would it work with finding the right translation to this that's a good question too, and really I don't know the answer. The, the thing is that you would have to figure it out, basically. Universities, uh, there's one university partner in the Bell M grant that's mapping European languages. It's called Nord University up in Norway. So it would probably be, you know, if the language is totally disappeared and there's nobody who understands it anymore, I think there's no way to do it. If you can find somebody who understands it, uh, then you can do it. But what you said also about poems is, is something a little different because, uh, you know, if the writer is still alive, you know, or died less than 75 years ago, you might not have the rights to do that, right? It's moral rights. It's another, another right. However, I think if... A, you could try to find the person, you know, who was the writer or whatever, the original person, and talk to them. Usually they would be very happy about that because, you know, when you talk to an artist about, about their song being understood by other people, usually they're happy about it or a poet or whatever. But if they weren't into it, they could block it, they could say no, and you just don't do it. 
but it, you know, uh, it's a good question. Last night in uh, in Montreal, in Toronto, we had five languages. One of them they didn't have a translation for, so we just left um, the original language. It was a language I don't even know where it was from, it be like Baromi or something like that. But Farsi, we found people who spoke Farsi. We translated that Spanish, French. I think there was one indigenous song as well, um, Mati. Um, so. Yeah, not you know, not everything's perfect, but you know, we, we you know, it's it's more like the concept, and once the concept is actually done, then you might find somebody because like, oh, you know, hey, I know that you know, a researcher at a university or whatever. Other questions? Logan? I hope uh, you can find somebody who will translate my Tarzan English. And uh, as you say, the language is very important, but also the timing is very important. And I want to thank you for coming in Skopje, and maybe our... Show everybody my back here. <laughs> so, yeah. Super. Six languages. That's nice. Thank you very much. I want to, to ask your, your colleagues for applause, and then we can continue with languages. Thanks, Thanks Logan. Thanks, Logan. And one other thing, just quick, uh, guys, look next year for the new top level domain dot music because it's going to allow a lot of different opportunities as well. Dot music, like dot org, dot com.